and we decided that we were going to do a draft ourselves. And uh, we're going to do a draft on fly patterns. Uh, I mean, bass will pretty much eat anything anyways. But uh, the weirdest thing I've ever caught on a redfish crack was a mullet. I would say the best tie that I've ever flied, or the best tie <laughs> that I've ever tied. <laughs> <laughs> and dude, it just sucks when you invest that much time into a fly and it just breaks off. That's probably the, that's probably the worst part of losing fly. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors, guys. So uh, today we got another one for you where we're going to talk about the NFL draft that just happened. And we're going to do a little draft of our own. And then Jose is also going to bring a Jack Wagon of the Week since we haven't done that segment in a while. So welcome back. And I guess we'll get started with the Jack Wagon of the Week, man. Yeah, man. So <clears throat> I didn't share this with Russ on purpose. I wanted to get his um, like just complete, raw, and and unfiltered opinion slash reaction so this comes courtesy of outdoor life and the title is drunk man kicks yellowstone bison hurts himself and gets arrested (laughs) 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 oh my gosh so apparently idiot there's this couple a 40 year old male and a does it say how old the female is 37 year old female was they were driving obviously intoxicated as the headline states and uh p- apparently the 40 year old uh, reportedly approached a herd of bison kicked one in the leg which unsurprising unsurprisingly resulted in injuries that prompted the individual to seek treatment at a nearby medical facility after the park rangers transported him for treatment the individual was charged with being under the influence of alcohol to the point of endangering oneself, <laughs> disorderly conduct, approaching wildlife, disturbing and disturbing wildlife. The other individual was arrested as part of the incident for driving under the influence, failing to yield to an emergency vehicle, and also for wildlife harassment. She, that person, she was driving the other the other guy, the guy who did the kicking of the bison. Uh, around at that time the encounter took place near the seven mile bridge on the western entrance road near the madison river both defendants pled not guilty to the charges uh in court on april 22nd as a press release points out each violation could result in up to five thousand dollars in fines and six months in jail if they are convicted wow I have no words. <laughs> I mean, first of all, how stupid do you have to be, even if you're not intoxicated, to want to go and kick a, bi- kick a bison? I mean, yes. these things are huge. It's it's a freaking car on legs that has horns and is full of muscle. Why would you even think that's a good idea? Yeah, it's not going to go well. One, I, I imagine yeah. kicking is like kicking a brick wall. That thing is just solid. Two... Yeah. I mean, dude, it's going to jack you up if it, if it turns around and hooks you or toss you right. or whatever. Oh, my God. And I those mean, things run a hell of a lot faster than we can. It's amazing how fast those things can run. Scary, actually. Stupid, man. He, he, he probably deserves a jack wagon of the month, if not a jack wagon of the year. That is just straight stupidity. Like, you ever listen to, <laughs> to the comedian Ron White? Yes, I've, I've heard of him. So before. he has this one thing that he says. He's like, you can't fix stupid. Oh, and yeah. That's 100%. You, you can't fix stupid with that guy. Like, that's just. <laughs> and what's the, what's the other saying? If you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. And yep. I mean, hopefully this dude's tough because, yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was, that was pretty stupid, pretty dumb. So public I, yeah. service announcement, leave the fuzzy cows alone. Don't, yes. don't touch them. Dude, do you follow the National Park Service on Instagram? <laughs> They're hilarious. <laughs> Dude, they posted one. I saw it earlier today. I had to pull it up. They posted it five hours ago, actually. So it says, bison may look friend-shaped, but they already have enough friends they want. Keep your distance and don't make it awkward. <laughs> and then they posted a picture of a bison. Oh, their Instagram cracks me up. Their PR person is like on point oh yeah. their team if they have a team it's it's hilarious they post the most funny things so yeah dude they're but, freaking yeah. awesome i love following them the same i can't understand why somebody would want to go kick one bro i don't know oh, man i just don't get it i don't get it <laughs> i just i want to know what went through their head like you know what you know what really sounds cool right now i think i want to go punch, i want to go kick that bison like i just don't understand how, the, how that even computes like how it would even enter one's mind that's insane 
no clue. It's people like that that I feel like we should just take warning labels off of everything and <laughs> let natural selection take its place. Like I mean, he would almost, be one of the first. I mean, to go. it could have happened. Is he's got he got lucky. It didn't get worse. Yeah, that's freaking stupid, dude. Speaking funny, of, though. I remember this. This is gonna get a little dark, but it just goes to show how like it just goes to show how detached we as a society are from the natural world to, to some extent. Anyway. I I remember coming across a story. It was a woman. Well, there was a so it was like some some drive through wildlife park in another country. So you can drive your vehicle through there and and see the wildlife and everything. Well, this one spot happened to have tigers in it, and this person I can't remember if it was a woman or if it was a male, but this this person got out of the vehicle to look at a tiger. The tiger was there. She gets or they get out. They try to capture a picture of the tiger and it starts charging at her and they or at them. And they try to get back in the vehicle and the door closed and it was locked and the tiger mauled them. I don't know. I don't know if they lived or not, but like, why in the hell would you get out of the car? I yeah. It's just that's crazy, dude. I don't understand. I mean, those are ferocious animals they they there are animals that have the capacity to tear you limb from limb why would you even risk wanting to get out of a solid steel vehicle yeah. to get a picture i mean <laughs> your priorities like it, it doesn't make sense to me i i don't know dude it i'm surprised but i'm also not surprised i don't know what that says about us as a as a species but yeah it's crazy yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Dude, that kind of reminds me of a uh so do you ever watch Mr. Ballin? Yes, dude. He's he's got some awesome stuff. He's a really good storyteller. He's a great storyteller. He told a story the other day of this guy that I don't know how true it is. Everything that he's that I've heard of his seems to be true. Um uh, it seems like he does extensive research, but this story almost doesn't even seem believable. But this guy was I, I want to say it was Africa. He was surfing on the African coast. And a great white shark attacked him twice and he was able to get away and he's bleeding profusely. And, um, he, he managed to, you know, surf back to the beach and rescue himself. Well, then he, uh, he gets in his vehicle and he's, you know, adrenaline pumping, but feels like he's going to die. And, um, I don't remember exactly what it was, something about having to get water. He pulled over and had to get water. And he's pretty much out of it and he's walking back to his car and then he feels the sharp pain on his side. He turns around and there's a lion biting him after he just got attacked by a shark, got away, is getting bitten by a lion. And then he he's able to get away and he's going back to his car and then he turns around because he starts hearing the roars that he was hearing and then hears them tenfold. Turns around, there's a whole pride of lions ready to attack him. And then he doesn't really remember much. He goes to open the car, realizes he dropped his keys when he was getting attacked by the oh, lion. Oh, no. So he can't even get into his car. There's pride of lions around him. He just got attacked by a shark. Then he got attacked by a lion. And then I guess there was a safari nearby that was coming by. And the guy fired his rifle, scared the lions off. And the dude lived. Oh, <laughs> like, how my in the hell, gosh, dude. In the same day, can you get attacked by a great white shark and a pride of lions and still survive? He is simultaneously the luckiest and also the unluckiest person in the yep. world on that day. That is yep. <laughs> insane. Yeah, dude. It, I think it was the episode that he posted uh, this past Sunday. Um, so you should go check it out. It's it's interesting. Dude, he I'm goes into all the to. details. I can't recite it the way that he did. But, dude, it was freaking insane. <laughs> I don't even know what to say, dude. Like, that's crazy. You go yeah. from barely making it out of the, out of the ocean trying to get home or wherever he's going. And then he almost got taken out by a lion. Yeah. Af- Africa's scary. Australia's scary too. But yeah, dude, it is. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like Australia is the one Island that has everything that can kill you. Like, you know, snakes and spiders and box jellyfish and great white sharks. I mean, there's just so many, there's freaking lizards that can kill you there. <laughs> there's yeah. everything that can kill you on. Yeah. They got, insane. they have some of the most venomous snakes in the world, the Taipan. Um, I forgot some of the other ones. And then like you mentioned, the, the jellyfish, great whites. It's yeah. The spiders too. Yeah. Do those huntsman spiders are freaking massive. Yeah. I saw a video like, this uh this guy was just driving down the road and one comes out of nowhere was in his car somewhere and it's just crawling across the dashboard dude i 
I don't even know what I would do. <laughs> I would, I'd drive off a freaking cliff. <laughs> we almost got killed by a bee. So yeah. imagine a big spider like that. Right. Oh, oh dude. Mm-mm. Nope. I'm good. I mean, I don't mind spiders. I don't mind snakes, but you have one that's the size of your face just come walking across your dash. Yeah, no, yeah, thank I'd, you. I'd probably jump out and tuck and roll. <laughs> Say, good luck. <laughs> yeah. I don't really oh, need that car anyway. It was a piece of junk. Right? So. <laughs> I'm getting that one. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, screw that. So... Well, I guess the next thing that we were going to talk about was the draft, man. Did you get to watch any of the draft? I did not, but I heard that the uh, University of Texas had quite the showing on draft day. Dude, they did. I was surprised, honestly. There was a few more people that I thought were going to possibly go first round that didn't go first round. Um, But Texas had 11 players drafted, which is nuts for, I mean, Texas had a good season last year. Don't get me wrong. Um, But, you know, Historically, for the past 15 years, haven't really been all that great. We've had the talent, haven't, haven't been able to develop them or, or mm-hmm. put them together to create a national championship team. And um, yeah, this uh, they had 11 players drafted and they had two. So they had 13 players leaving. 11 of them got drafted. Two of them got signed as free agents after the fact, which I just thought was amazing. The only team that had more draft picks than Texas was Michigan and they had 13. And then Texas plays Michigan in Ann Arbor this upcoming season. I'm so freaking excited for Dude, that game. Not only Michigan, but... The old rivalry, too, with A&M. Yep, I'm excited for that one. Played Georgia, I think, too, and Florida also. It's going to be so, a tough season. It'll be, it'll be a tough be, season, it'll, it'll be, be fun to watch. Oh, yeah, it'll be really good to see them play and really exciting. And I can't wait to see what Xavier Worthy does in the NFL, dude. Right. He had an dude, awesome. it's freaking insane. Xavier Worthy is going to be there with Patrick Mahomes. Scary. Like, Dude, it's gonna yeah, Mahomes is gonna have a bunch of weapons. They're gonna be pretty pretty dangerous again. And I, I mean, I know a lot of people don't like Mahomes. I like watching Mahomes play. He's really really fun to watch. And uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they how they do with these uh, these new weapons and the stupid Cowboys. I don't know what's gonna happen this season. We'll see. I was hoping they were gonna pick up Jonathan Brooks, but they didn't. Yeah, they yeah. passed on him. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> Being a Cowboy fan is hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I still, I mean, I don't follow NFL, but I still have a little bit of alliance to him, I guess, because I was a fan for so long. So, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they do it. I feel like their draft wasn't all that great, but I mean, what can you do? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we'd like to think that they know what to do, and so we'll see what happens. Right. Ain't that the truth? So, yeah. but in that same vein, we decided that we were going to do a draft ourselves. And uh, we're going to do a draft on fly patterns and um, we're going to format it. We're going to pick six flies each and it's going to be an all around box. So in in this box that we're going to have, we're going to have an imaginary box with six flies in it. And those flies are going to be what are going to give us the most success, no matter the conditions, the weather conditions, the water conditions, the location. And so it's going to be the best all around box. We're going to post it on Instagram, post it on Facebook, and we're going to tally all the votes and see who wins. Um, so it's going to be me against him seeing who can create the best team from the draft. So yeah, um, it's going to be subsurface flies, top water flies, you know, warm water, cold water, salt water, doesn't yeah. matter. So so essentially, like in layman's terms, like imagine you have two fly boxes in front of you. One is going to be comprised of the flies that Russell picks. One is going to be the one that I pick. And ultimately, you want to choose whichever one, whichever box you think you would like to have, in, you know, for whatever water body you're, you're trying to fish. So yep. it's kind of what we're what we're trying to get at with this. And uh, yeah, man, I, I think I got my list ready whenever you're ready. OK, I think I'm ready. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Okay. Or do you want to? I have a quarter. You want to flip for it? Yeah, we can flip for it. All right, let's see. Oh, uh, you can call it. Ready? I'll call it in the air. Oh, shit. Okay, ready? Go for it. Heads. It is heads. Okay, I'll go ahead and go you, first. You're going to go first? All right. Yeah. All right. So for my first round pick, I am going to choose mainly because I'm afraid that you might choose it. And it's going to be a common thing. But it catches everything. A Klaus Romino. Ooh. <laughs> I had a feeling I was going to go first. Um, <laughs> but I actually had two. Um, the other one, for my, I guess for, for my pick, it'd be the Wooly Bugger. That was the other one I was debating <laughs> yeah. on. I, 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 figured, I figured one of, I figured they were going to go, they're going to be the first picks. So you got, you have the Klauser. All right. 
So now you're going to get your second round pick back to back. Oh, man. Okay. Round number two. I think I'm going to go with, and I'm, I'm going to go with this because there's been so many variations of this fly. It's fairly new, I suppose, um, but it's been used, I mean, just about everywhere. And as a, it's been a game changer. And as his name implies, I think I'm going to go with the game changer for number two. That was also on my list. All right. For my second round pick is actually going to be a regional fly tied by somebody um, in Austin that no longer lives in Austin. And that fly is going to be the lunch money. Mm. I have caught eight different species on that fly. Solid fly. And then for my third round pick, just kind of break it up and not do a subsurface fly. Um, I think I'm going to go with a double barrel popper. Ooh, good one. I think you and I were on the same wavelength because for my third pick, I also have something that's not subsurface. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I think I'm going to go with a diver, the Dahlberg diver. That was on my list also. All right. So what's going to be your fourth round pick? Oh, shit. I forgot to go again. And see, after after three, that's when I started having a really hard time trying to figure out what I wanted to pick. Um, Man, then I'm going to go with another surface fly. I'm going to go with a gurgler. Damn. <laughs> that was on my list also. All right. For my fourth round pick, I kind of changed it up a little bit. It is going to be a topwater fly. Um, but it's going to be a fly that is more used for in the mountains for further up north, cold water species. Um, although I have used them and I have caught bass and brim on them, it's going to be a chubby Chernobyl. Dude, I had that on my list too. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Dang, good pick, good pick. And then to go back to subsurface because... Honestly, I've caught more fish subsurface than I have topwater. Although catching on topwater is a lot more exciting to watch. Um, it's going to be also a fly created by Matt Bennett. And it is going to be the Rio Getter. Mm. Solid. And I just noticed something. Most of our list, well, I would say the, major the majority of our listeners are probably from Texas. So this mm -hmm. list, your list is looking pretty strong. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Dang it. I think for my next pick, it's my turn, right? Yes. You get your fifth and sixth. Oh, shoot. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Number five. I'm going to go with a deceiver. Good pick. The Number six. I think I'm going to make number six a regional pick. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to pick it because it's personally one of my favorite flies and I've caught a ton of stuff with it. And I'm pretty sure you could take the same fly and go catch some trout in the mountains and stuff. So I'm going to go with a Lano bug. I knew it was going to be on your list. It was on my list too. All right. So this is going to be my last pick. And I have so many flies that I still want to pick. You want to... Make it just like the NFL draft and do seven rounds? Sure. Why not? <laughs> We're already this far into it. Let's go. <laughs> okay. So I'll get my six and seven, then you'll get your seven. And ah, this is so hard. My six is going to be a saltwater pattern. And most fish that you would want to fish for on the coast eat shrimp or crab. So... I'm going to do the Hopedale Crab for my sixth pick. And for my final pick, oh, it's so hard. I feel like I need some more top water. So I'm going to go ahead and go with the Elk Hercatus. Oof, that's a good one too. I have that one actually as one of the potential picks. See, and I, I purposely left off like nymphs and small stuff because one, I just don't like throwing them. Out, so mm -hmm. That's the main reason. Number two is like if, if I'm building a box that can be used freshwater or saltwater, I'm sure they can catch saltwater fish, but probably like little pinfish and stuff. Yeah. Um, dude, so I was trying to pick some of the bigger, I guess, more general type things. Streamers mainly. For my seven, I might stick 
to that theme, many of the flies that I have can be used for saltwater. So I'm hesitant on picking a saltwater only pattern because of that. But I kind of feel like I should include this one specific saltwater pattern because I use it to catch my first redfish on the fly. So it has a little bit of a soft spot in my heart because of that. And that would be the redfish crack. I think I'm going to go with on my list. Crack. Dude, I've caught so many things on a redfish crack. I caught smallmouth on it, largemouth on it. I've caught green sunfish on it. I've caught red-eared sunfish on it. I've caught, uh, I, I've actually never caught a redfish on a redfish crack. Um, <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure. so many things. I'm sure if you played with the, uh, the hook sizes and the colors, you can mm-hmm. make it a bass fly, you know? I mean, bass will pretty much eat anything anyways. Right. But uh, the weirdest thing I've ever caught on a redfish crack was a mullet. And it actually, the mullet ate it. Like it was in his really? mouth. Yes, dude. That was actually, so the first time that I made a fly fishing specific trip to the coast was with Marco. And the mullet on a redfish crack was the first saltwater fish I caught when I actually like was trying specifically to just fly fish. And really? uh, yeah, on that same trip with Marco, it was, it was weird, man. I just saw some like, it looked like nervous water. So I cast it over there and I'm just stripping and I just, it actually fought pretty decently. I was very surprised. But when I, when I, found, I thought it was a ladyfish or something at first. And when I got it to the, to my hand, I was like, what the hell, dude? It was a freaking mullet, man. I think I remember you telling, telling that story on a previous episode of the There's podcast. There's a picture on my Instagram. That thing ate it. It was crazy. That's freaking crazy. insane. <laughs> but yeah. So I guess to reiterate my, Seven picks. Number one, Wooly Bugger. Two, Game Changer. Three is a Dahlberg Diver. Four is Gurgler. Five is Deceiver. Six is a Lando Bug. And seven is a Redfish Crack. Yep. And mine are, first pick is Clouser. The second pick is a Lunch Money. The third pick is going to be a Double Barrel Popper. Uh, fourth pick is the Chubby Chernobyl. Fifth pick is the Rio Getter. Sixth pick is the Hopedale Crab. Seventh pick is the Elk Hair Caddis. So those are our picks. Those are our teams. We'll post them up on the socials and uh, y'all go vote for them. And we'll leave it open probably for a week or two before we finally tally them up and, and decide who wins. Um, do you have any honorable mentions, any others on your list that you want to mention that will not go on our list? Honorable mention. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Um... Yes. Honorable mention probably be a crease fly, mm-hmm. surf that candy. That was also on my list. And uh, the Rio Bandito. Rio Bandito was not on my list. I had surf candy, Borsky slider, redfish crack, the oh, carpet dude. bomb, a copper john, and a Duracell. Um, I decided not to go with the smaller nymphs and stuff. Uh, I forgot about the Borsky. copper johns and Duracells. Um, and then for top water, I had a dragonfly and a Dito popper. And I had a lot of the smaller ones I had just in case you took a lot of the bigger ones that I, that I had on there. Um, Cause you can always downsize, you know, downsizing mm-hmm. is kind of the thing, you know, if you're not catching anything and you want to catch something to get the skunk off the boat, or if you're in a survival and kind of the mindset that I had going into this is if I have one fly box and one fly rod and I'm traveling car breaks down, get a flat, get ran off the road by, you know, missing a deer or I'm on a plane and the plane crashes and I have no clue where I'm going to be. What box would I hope that I had that could cover no matter where I'm at geographically? Yeah. So that was kind of the mindset I had when picking these flies. And um, so that's why I had a lot of the smaller nymphs and stuff on there. Yeah. See, but, mine was like, that's a man. Yeah, that's a good way to approach it. I guess mine was, if like me being in Texas, for example, if I wanted to take a fly, like a fly box and just, you know, I could take it to the hill country. I could take it to the coast, whatever. I could fish pretty much everything in that box. And I mean, obviously there's like some, some wiggle room, right? Like if you could tie them in different sizes, different colors and yeah. everything, that's kind of like, I guess the caveat that I had with that, with this mindset is if I can make smaller gurglers and stuff for pan fish and everything, or if I can, Wooly bugger, if I can beef up the hook and change the colors and tie something redfish might like or trout might like, then that could work. But that was kind of my 
I guess my thinking of of and the reasoning behind why I picked the flies I did. But I don't exactly. know, dude. That was harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> it's hard to narrow them down because there's so many fly patterns out there that I've had a lot of success with. Yeah. And, you know, from fishing in Alaska to New Mexico to, you know, in Florida and Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and Mississippi, mm-hmm. like I've fished all these different places and I've caught so many different things on different flies. It's hard to narrow it down, you know? Dude, it is. And then kind of, then I was telling you this before we actually started the podcast here lately, especially because I live in Texas. I mostly tie patterns from the state, like more regional stuff, mm-hmm. like Lano bugs, Lano lopes. Um, I tie a lot of Matt Bennett's patterns, a Rio, uh, Rio getters, uh, carpet bombs, uh, brunch money, stuff like that. And then Chris Johnson's Rio Bandito, I tie a lot of too. Well, here recently, I guess. And so I tie mainly that stuff because I'm fishing here a lot. And then for the coast, most of my stuff has been. Uh, redfish cracks or variations on the crack with certain other things um, or variations of the Borski slider, stuff like that. And, uh, and so a lot of these patterns that I had on my list, I, I've heard of, but it may be I've fished at some point in my life, but it's not something that I, I fish now currently. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And so it's just, it was just really hard to start thinking about other things that, you know, people who are not from Texas might use or be familiar with. Right. That's the then, yeah, it, it was tough. It was hard. It definitely is. And I was also thinking, so we have listeners on the podcast that are, you know, overseas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't think very many of them follow us on social media. So I was kind of thinking, I was like, well, you know, should I pick a pattern that is, you know, internationally known? But yeah. then I don't know if I'm going to get votes that way. You know, I may, I may cater to the listeners and they may yeah. be like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. You know, but if they don't follow us on so- socials and they're not going to vote, you know, it's kind of like, what do I do there? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, well, uh, I'll make up some type of graphic and I'll put our picks and y'all go on the socials and vote and, uh, we'll see who wins. I feel like we both have really good boxes. So. I wouldn't be disappointed. And I'm going I'm to put them up there. I'm not going to say whose box is who on social media. So if you want to vote, from that, I mean, obviously, you listen to the episode, you're going to know whose is whose. Um, but on the social medias, you know, I'm not going to put whose is whose. It's going to be a black yeah. box. So that's awesome. This should be fun. Yeah. But I dude, think it's so be fun for sure. Speak. So I have a question. It's something that I've thought about in the past. I don't know if you have or not. <clears throat> but talking about all the fly names and stuff. Well, number one, fly fishermen, for whatever reason, name things oddly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but number two, like, this is this is one of those random shower thoughts, right? How <laughs> how different does a fly have to be before it can be named or called something else? Like for for example, and I mean I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious because I mean I'm I'm sure that there have been instances where an individual in one part of the country might be tying this thing and calling it something. And then someone else elsewhere in the world might be tying the exact same thing or something similar and then tie in and call it something completely different. Yeah. And, um, and also like, like, again, just at what point is it different enough to call it something different? Uh, I guess the example that comes to my head immediately is, is the woolly bugger. For, there are mm-hmm. many variations of the woolly bugger. There's one called the thin mint bugger, where it's mm-hmm. essentially, uh, I believe it is peacock curl body instead of chenille. Mm-hmm. And then it has a tri-colored tail, olive, brown, and black. Yeah. And, but it's, but in, in form, it is the exact same thing as a woolly bugger. It's, it still has yeah. a, chen, it still has a marabou tail. It still has some kind of like buggy looking body with hackle, you know, uh, palmered around it and either a bead or no bead for the head. It is in function a or a composition rather and in function, I suppose a woolly bugger. Yeah. But it's just different. And yeah. some people call it, they just call it the thin mint bugger or they just call it the thin mint. But yeah. you know, which what it is specifically when you refer to it that, but it is exactly. like, a, it's a variation of a woolly bugger. The other one's like a, it's called a golden retriever or something like that. Again, it looks kind of like a woolly bugger, has a marabou tail, but it's tied. It's got a very specific color to it. 
And then the body is made out of, um, I think it's cactus chenille or something in the, mm-hmm. in the, but it's like translucent. So you're supposed to like wrap, I'm probably getting it wrong, but from what I understand, you kind of wrap the underbody with some red thread and then you wrap the golden mylar material around it, but it's kind of translucent. So you can see that, that red thread underneath it. And that's kind of what makes it like the golden retriever. And I think that's more of a regional thing. I think it's from the East Coast, if I'm not mistaken. But again, it's very similar to a woolly bugger. It's just tied different and obviously differently named. So yeah. I just, I've always been curious. I've always been curious about that. Like, what, at what point is a fly no longer the fly that it was? It can be called something else. I've always wondered the same thing. And they talked about it a little bit on the Honey Hole pa- Honey Hole podcast last week. Um, oh, really? They had Matt Bennett on. Yeah, they had Matt Bennett on, and they were talking about some of the flies that Zach Harris ties that are very similar to those of Matt Bennett. And they kind of got into that conversation a little bit too, where people are saying, "Oh, he's just mimicking Matt Bennett type of stuff." And it's, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Matt was like, "Yeah, I mean, it's awesome that people are saying that about me, like that people are copying me." He's like, "You know that that that's awesome," but he kind of said like, I mean, you're going to tie what you're going to tie. It's going to be different materials. It may have the same functionality, you know, using similar materials, but different. It's not the same fly or different color. It's not really the same fly, even though it is the same fly. Um, I think where it becomes an issue is if you're marketing it and you're making a profit off it. You know, I think that's where it becomes kind of one of those things, but the way that I see it in all honesty, if you're just tying it for self use, call it what you want, you know? And if somebody says, oh, that's very similar to this fly, then you can say, oh yeah, I kind of took, you know, inspiration from that fly. Or if you don't want to do that, just say, yeah, oh, cool. I I didn't even know that my fly was like that fly. That's pretty cool, but I'm just using it for me. I think it becomes an issue when you're making a profit off it or trying to make a profit off it. See, that's a good point. And uh, I I haven't listened to that podcast yet. I I need to, sounds like it'd be interesting, but that's a good point. I've never, cause I've been, I've been asked by people, um, they're like, oh man, like, like sometimes I'll just tie a fly that, Either I just throw together randomly at the vice or is a variation in, a, in an already existing pattern. And uh, somebody would be like, Oh, what do you, what do you call this? Like, Oh, I don't know. I just, it's just a little spin off I did of, so, of, of this pattern or of that pattern or whatever. And, um, I don't have it. Like, I don't have a name for it. But yeah, man, it's, uh, I think it's a good point. I think if you're, yeah, for sure. If you're making money or planning to make money off a of fly, then I, I imagine the details become a bit muddied yeah. and uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I got some backlash on one fly. I don't know, uh, know if you remember, but a few years ago, we uh, I went back to Texas and we were tying up at the Holiday Inn there in San Marcos and we were drinking some Modelo and tying and I tied up this thing that was admittedly similar to a lunch money, some slightly different materials, but we were drinking Modelo and I oh, had the Modelo different, Minnow. Yeah, yeah, the Modelo Minnow, right? Oh, yeah, and so yeah, I, yeah. I, I made a mix of browns and golds and flash and stuff like that. And it looked similar to the color of the, the top like foil of the Modelo. And it was like a minnow pattern, a bait fish pattern. It's mm-hmm. called a Modelo Minnow. Well, I've had a few people, oh, that's just like the lunch money. And it's like, oh, okay. I mean, I'm not trying to sell the thing. I'm just saying I tied up this thing. I thought it was pretty cool. And I thought it would catch fish, which it yeah. did. Um, but I just called it Modelo Minnow. We were hanging out, drinking Modelo and tying yeah. flies. Like, I don't see an issue with that. Now, if I tried to market this thing and sell it and say, this is my creation, it's a whole nother story. And not only that, dude, but had you never even heard of or seen the lunch buddy up to that point, then you would have no clue what that thing even is. Exactly. Because exactly. It, it, because it is so regional. Like, I mean, the lunch, for example, the Rio Getter. Rio Bandito, all these are regional to Texas, really. I I would venture to think that if you if you talk to somebody from Montana who had never been to Texas, fished in Texas or whatever, who didn't really know some of the tires around here, probably they would probably have no clue what these things are. You're just making up names. (laughs) So exactly. (laughs) So it's I don't know, man. It's just so interesting, dude. I always found that fascinating. And it's also one of the reasons why, like, I hesitate naming anything, um, right? Just right. because it's probably some that somehow or somebody somewhere has already done. Like, yeah, no, this is just something I threw together at the vice. It, it's you know, kind of a spin on I don't know, the Borsky slider or whatever the case is. I just change this and this instead of that or whatever. But see, I see is, it kind of differently. Like, I see it in contrast to that. If you post something and name it yourself, 
somebody else might be like, oh, dude, that's actually similar to this. And then you can actually pull inspiration and learn different methods and different materials to use in a similar way. So it may open your eyes to other things as well and introduce you to a pattern that you may not be familiar with. Yeah. That's I'd true. I name it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I just don't think I can personally. If somebody wants to name it, like, oh, yeah, you, got, you should call it this. Like, you can call it whatever you want. I don't care. It's just, right. I'm just going to tie it. But I just tied something yeah, to catch some fish. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, crazy stuff, man. Interesting yeah. stuff. I should I should listen to that Bennett in the Honey Hole pot, uh, episode. Yeah. That sounds pretty good. I'm not sure if it's out yet. I, I watched it live because they're doing mm. their the recordings live now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it, it'll be coming out soon if it's not. But yeah, you should you should definitely listen to it. Yeah, man. I'm gonna have to give that one give that one a listen to. So talking about fly tying, on the other hand of that, fly fishing. Have you been out lately? Once. I went once last week, I think. Uh, uh-huh. It was a really nice evening when I got home from 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 class and everything. So, talked to my buddy uh, Savi, my roommate, and uh, we went to a local pond. We could just walk to. It's really close to our neighborhood, and this this pond, it can be pretty good. And I've heard some rumors about certain fish being there. I don't know if it's true. Like, I've heard on two on two occasions people catching what they describe as being real grand cichlids, mm-hmm. but I've never seen one. I've, I've never caught one. Not to say that they're not there. There could be very small populations, like very small or uh, very localized to certain parts of that little pond. But supposedly there's some Rios in there. Supposedly there's a big gar in there too. And then there was, I had seen it before, hadn't seen it in a while. So I don't know if it's still hanging around or not. Um, but this little pond is pretty cool um fish is pretty nice and we caught a bunch of fish that day some some bluegills and some some bass it was a pretty nice evening and then what's cool is there's an heb um it's right behind an heb here in town and we're me and my buddy had uh we just finished up we were about to start walking to the back to the house like hey dude why don't you just go have a beer at heb he goes with our fly fishing stuff i was like yeah, what are they going to do? Kick us out. So we walked <laughs> over there and, uh, and yeah, man, we just got in there. We just grabbed a beer and we just hung out at HEB with all our five fish and stuff and just, just talked, whatever. And the guys are like, dude, we've never seen anybody come here with fish and stuff before. Y'all, y'all have any luck? We're like, oh yeah, dude, we caught some fish, whatever. And they're really chill about it. Like, oh man, we'd love to see it, dude. Yeah. Y'all just come hang out whenever y'all want. We're like, cool. We'll do. So we just hung out, had a beer, then we went back, we went back to the house. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, dude. And apparently, I and, and I haven't done it, but he says that you can even order a beer and then walk around and grocery shop while you drink it, and then just go check out. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I used to love doing the pick six that they had at H E B. All yeah. the different regional beers and craft beers and stuff, dude. You remember that banana beer? The banana yes, bread beer. That one's oh, good. It was so freaking good from the UK. You remember when we did the uh, pick six at a liquor store when we were like really young and <laughs> we got nothing but IPAs <laughs> and we hated oh. IPAs, but we didn't know we hated oh. IPAs at that point in time. Yeah. Do we, oh, I think there's horrible. only one beer in the, and, and then we ended up, I think we each ended up picking one quote unquote safe beer that we knew that we would like just in case we don't like any of the other stuff. Yeah. And those are the only beers we, <laughs> we actually yeah. drank. Dude, it was horrible. And it was funny because I don't, I don't, I know I didn't at the time. I didn't know what an IPA was. I didn't either. And uh, all the names were so clever. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Or it has this cool picture on it <laughs> and all colorful, <laughs> like a kid picking cereal, you know? If it has bright colors, we picked it. And dude, they were, oh, it was, they were horrible. And I've dude. actually started to kind of, I wouldn't say like IPAs, but there's a lot more IPAs that I can palette now that. I I definitely couldn't. Before. I man, I love a good IPA. I I used to hate them. Now I really really like them, and uh, I kind of have a funny story. So me, uh, some friends of ours from Austin, um, we went out one night, and um, I forgot where we were at, but they had some drinks there. Where I think we were having dinner, but they had some beers and stuff there, and. I jokingly sometimes call IPAs IPAs and I didn't really register what was going on. And the lady, the, the, the server came by and she's like, yeah, what can I get you to drink? I was like, well, what kind of IPAs you guys got? <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone just looked at me like, what the hell? <laughs> That's freaking hilarious. <laughs> oh, dude, it was embarrassing, but it was funny. That's awesome. <laughs> dude, yeah, there's there's a few IPAs that I've had that, that I've liked. Um, have you ever had Sweetwater IPAs? 
Yes, that's the one with the little trout on there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've tried Dude, one of those. Those, those ones are good. pretty good. There, there's, I think they have like three or four different IPAs. Um, I, I think I tried the four twenty, the four twenty something. Mm-hmm. I can't remember. What yeah, that one. the one with the little uh, highway sign on it. Yes, interstate sign. That's uh-huh. four twenty. Yeah, that one. Uh, that one's really good. I think yeah. that's probably one of my favorite of theirs. Those are really good. I don't know if I've had any of the other ones. I know I've had that one for sure. That one I mm-hmm. liked a lot. I think they have a hazy IPA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I do like hazy IPAs. There's there, there, there's a, a pizza place in Austin called Pint House, and they have oh, dude, I love Pint really. House. I mean, first of all, their, their pizza is phenomenal. It's really, really good. A second, their beer selection is also phenomenal. They have one called an Electric Jellyfish, and that one's I think really. I got that one when we were there last time with Marco. Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, that one's really good. And they one used really to. They used to have this one. I can't remember what it's called. I think it was called. Um, Oh shoot, dude! Did you, did you ever watch the Flintstones? Yeah. Do you remember the 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 place where they Bedrock? I think it was called mm-hmm. I think it was called Bedrock or something like that. I can't remember. Um, I, I'm probably totally mistaken if I. I'm sorry, but dude, it was freaking awesome. One of the best beers I've ever had. Period. It was really, really? good. But I think it was like a seasonal thing because they often do. They have a really like they they're constantly rotating their selection out. So one might be there. That, uh, or you might go in and one's not there that was there the week before or whatever. So yeah. I cannot for the life of me remember. I think that's what it's called. That's for some reason coming to my mind. But dude, that one was really good too. I've also become a fan of uh, of uh, porters. I like darker yeah, I beers and stuff. I love porters. Porters and stouts. My dude, favorites. you remember that one that we got when we floated the uh, buffalo? It had like the little bear on the on the beer can or whatever. Oh, the coffee one? Yes, dude. Dude, I have been looking for that. That and one I was so good. It. I've so even good. been Googling trying to find out, like, I've been typing, you know, coffee beers, and, and I cannot remember for the life of me what it was called, but it was so freaking good. Yeah, man. I can't. I it only was like remember a black the, and red with the yeah, bear. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that one was it awesome. Was, it was really good. If I'm not mistaken, it was a Missouri brew. Um, I think you're right. It may have been a Northwest Arkansas brew. Um, but yeah, I haven't been able to find it. Like I've Googled it and everything. I can't, I don't even remember what it was called. I might have a picture of it actually. I'll have to look for it later. Ooh, that, I'll send I didn't it to you about that. Yeah. I'll I went looking through that. my pictures and I, I didn't have a picture of it or a video of it. Um, I had videos of, of us brewing coffee, but not the coffee <laughs> beer. So, but dude, yeah, dude, that's that so weird because you, do you don't even like coffee. I'm starting to man. Really? Dude, if you come up here, you're, you need to try some of this foretold coffee. This stuff is so freaking good. I'm still yeah. working my way through a two pound bag of beans, but yeah. once I get through it, I'm going <laughs> to order a different flavor. This one's the Mexican honey. I want to try the El Salvador, El Salvadorian bourbon next. Oh, um, that sounds good, dude. Oh, they're so freaking good. So there's, good. There's a uh, here in College Station. There's actually a few really good coffee places. There's um, mm-hmm. a place called Polite Coffee, another place called Buzz, or what's the Buzz? I think it's what it's actually called. Uh-huh. Um, Polite has a storefront and so you can go in there and you can actually order coffee there you can buy coffee there whatever and Sarah and I will go there sometimes and they have this one called breakfast in bed and what they do is they take milk that has been I guess flavored by um, fruity pebbles and they will mix it into coffee so they make like a little latte from that holy that crap dude it's friggin awesome it's a it's a it's a bit sweet um, I normally like my coffee black, mm-hmm. uh, kind of, I mean, I don't know why I just, I, well, I learned to drink it that way when I was working on my master's, my, my advisor, he's, um, from Bolivia, but I believe he has some Italian influence if I'm not mistaken. And I will never forget it. I was hurting for coffee real bad, dude. I was like super sluggish. I was just, I was just not focused. And, uh, he asked me, he goes, Hey, you want some coffee? I was like, sure. And he would bring it. He would, he would brew some for the lab sometimes because we're, mm-hmm. there's a bunch of people there all the time. And, um, and, uh, he brewed it and he gave me a cup. And I, I remember I turned to him and I looked at it and, and I looked at him. And I was like, Hey, do you have any cream or any sugar? He looks at me. He goes, <laughs> dude, this ain't Starbucks. You got to drink it like that. He goes, a good coffee is like a good steak. It should be able to stand on its own. And I was like, okay, that's fair. So I, it took me a while to get used to drinking black coffee, but. Now that's like, that's my go-to. I, I drink it black when I can, just because I feel like you can actually taste the differences, almost like uh, drinking whiskey neat, if you will. You can, yeah. you can kind of like taste those little differences, little nuances or whatever. And, uh, and, uh, that being said though, on occasion, I like, you know, 
so, like you know things like that like the breakfast in bed or whatever just if i if i'm feeling it but do that dangerous dude really good and then in buzz they have this blend i think it's a seasonal blend it's called day of the dead and the coffee bag looks sick dude it looks dope and it's a um i think it's i think it i think the beans are roasted in mexico or they're a variety from mexico can't remember those are fantastic one of the best coffees i've ever had dude they're nice f- super good phenomenal Dude, would you ever roast your own beans? I would like to at some point in my life. I think that'd be sick. I feel like it'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Do different things and, you know, different flavors and stuff like that. And kind of going back to the portal thing, that's why I like them because there's a story behind his three flavors. And so he sources the beans from that area. And he also has a blog on his website. And um, so they like tell the story behind where the flavor came from. And it's just interesting stuff like that. I love the backstory. And I feel like I would probably do something like if if I were to ever start roasting myself, I'd probably do something similar. Like there would have to be a reason why there's a certain flavor. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So that's pretty cool, man. I've never, you were telling me about it. I'd love to try it. Maybe when I can, if and when I can go up to to our Kansas. I I can probably send you some. I I got a two pound bag. (laughs) <laughs> probably about a pound and a half now but yeah i can uh i can bag some up and send it to you i still have your birthday gifts from last year that i haven't sent you yet. i know so oh speaking of that so yeah i also got your birthday gift so um podcasters or uh listeners it was actually russell's birthday on the 26th last week it was it so was. happy birthday brother and Thanks, it's bro. also been the one year anniversary of this podcast yes. It has been one year since we published our first episode. Our first episode was published April 28th, 2023. So uh, it's been a year and it's crazy because it doesn't feel like it's been a year until I think about it. And then I think about it. I'm like, holy crap. Like, I feel like we've gotten a lot more comfortable behind the microphone, which is a good thing. Yeah. But at the same time, it can kind of be a bad thing because we just kind of let stuff roll off the tongue. (laughs) (laughs) But still... Yeah, man, I still feel like I'm a little stiff. I just, <clears throat> but that's just my, I guess, my introverted side. But compared to the first episode we ever aired, that one was painful. The yeah. first few, Dude, the were first episode really we recorded was painful. That's why we didn't yeah. put it out. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> between bad. technical difficulties and just awkwardness. Yeah, but yeah, dude, it's crazy. We've been doing it for a freaking year, man. <laughs> that's so wild, man. It is. It is. And I'm hoping that we got some big stuff coming this year. Yeah. Yeah. So. some exciting stuff hopefully yes i know that we have some exciting ones coming up soon um but i'm yeah. hoping we continue to grow yeah so. for sure and i guess in that same vein we had talked about doing like a one year bash type of thing where mm-hmm. we can get together and do a live episode and just you know have some listeners come and hang and whatever and uh actually chris fowler if i'm not mistaken he offered up his fly shop for us to do that he would he would host mm-hmm. us which was awesome of him uh unfortunately just because of life circumstances and stuff we couldn't make that happen this year but maybe depending on how things go in the next month or maybe even next year we can make we can do something i think that'd be yeah. really really cool I think next year, like, I'm definitely going to make sure it happens, you know, yeah. if I have to come, you know, to Texas or whatever, because that's where most of our listeners in the States are, yeah. um, you know, I'm, we have to make it happen. Two years would be a big deal because like most podcasters don't make it six months. And then there's like a little grace period where if they make it six months, they're probably going to make it a year, but making it two years is like the big drop off between one year and two years where people either get burnt out or they realize that they're not going to make money on it. And for us, it's just a passion project. You know, we're not making any money on it. And I don't even really think our goal is to make money. Um, we just kind of want to get the word on conservation out there and we have fun doing it. So yeah, um, and just talk it's a passion to cool project people. for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's a passion project for us. Um, so if we could make it two years, that would be awesome. Yeah. But I think that's where there's a large fall off is yeah. in between one year and two years. So if we make it two years, we we have to do something. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's what's pretty cool, too, because I remember when, when you and I first started, we were like, oh, yeah, you know, we're just going to kind of see where it goes. I mean, that that is what we're doing, but I don't think we ever, we didn't expect to have the experiences that we've had with it. You know, like we, right. we've met a ton of really nice, really cool people. And yeah. uh, I think that's probably been the coolest thing to come from it so far. And uh, yeah, just, just like the different things that have come from that. It's just, 
at first, I think we had the expectation like, oh, yeah, we're just going to, you know, come and bullshit with our friends and everything, which is also great. We have had friends of ours come on and it's been awesome having them on. But we've also had the opportunity to have some to meet some people who we've never even met and then literally yeah. just kind of talk to them for like the first five, 10 minutes before the podcast and then during the podcast. And then, you know, we can still kind of talk with them afterwards. And uh, it, and that's still like you can keep in touch with them. I think that's been pretty cool, too. So it's exactly. been it's been pretty interesting seeing how everything kind of transpired with this podcast. Yeah. It's been pretty fun. And yeah. and we've been able to, you know, talk with people on a personal level of people that we didn't know we'd ever be friends with or never thought that we would be friends with and yeah. uh, have created these friendships um, with people in the industry and not in the industry. So it's just been exciting. So, yeah. Crazy, man. Crazy. Yeah. But so I guess fun. happy, happy anniversary of your birth and happy anniversary to the podcast, bro. <laughs> Thanks, bro. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And yeah, happy anniversary for the show, man. Um, with that being said, we have new stickers. I'm going to hold one up here. So for those of y'all that are watching, um, they are waterproof die cut stickers. And nice. um, if y'all want them, reach out to me, um, reach out to the wildlife outdoors, Instagram, Facebook, um, me personally, and um, I can send them out. So I haven't figured out pricing or anything like that. It's, I mean, probably just what I paid for them. You know, I'll have to calculate. I don't remember. I'll have to calculate it out to see how much each sticker was. But um, yeah, waterproof die cut stickers. If, if y'all want stickers, we got new ones. We still have some of our old ones that are the uh, real grand cichlid stickers. Um, and then some that we never really put out that have, you know, a fly rod and a tent and some trees on them. Um, so yeah, y'all, if y'all want stickers, reach out, let me know. Um, I did kind of want to talk about, a little bit of fishing that I've done lately because I've been able to get out a lot more lately. And so, um, shout out to Joe Ram, Ozark Media up in uh, Northwest Arkansas. I met up with him a couple weeks ago up on the Kings River and he showed me this freaking gorgeous stretch of river, dude. It was, I mean, it was gorgeous. The water was crystal clear. It was in the Ozarks. The freaking foliage was in full bloom. Like, dude, it was awesome. And uh, caught, you know, a small mouth, just one. It was, it was, <laughs> they were getting their jiggy on and um i'm not one to cast on beds um but yeah there there wasn't very many smallmouth that i saw um but fishy freaking water like i can guarantee you probably in the next week or two maybe even a month it's gonna freaking get crazy up there in terms of like what you can catch um but dude we came across some gar i have never seen a i guess they're considered schools i've never seen a school of gar where each individual gar was so big there must really? have been at least 15 of them that were over four foot long jeez dude dude it was nuts and they were coming up right next to the kayak like six inches from me and sipping and splashing that's and, awesome uh, I, I got startled a couple of times because i was just like oh shit, what was that like just freaking massive gar just breaching right next to me like it was awesome and then saw a bunch of other uh you know largemouth bass smallmouth bass kind of strolling along the edge and stuff dude it was just this gorgeous hole that he took me to it was freaking awesome uh but we did a little bit of filming up there and uh you know caught caught some fish and he caught a freaking uh i think he caught a rock bass which i've never really? caught rock bass so i was like oh, that's pretty cool so that is pretty cool yeah dude it was it was a good time but uh you know he, he's a cool guy and uh hopefully i'll get to get up and go fish with him again at some point and or he's always welcome down here um but yeah dude hopefully we'll have some collapse coming with him in the future um his freaking camera set up and drone set up is like sweet dude it makes me want to just jump and jump and get one immediately but my bank account says no <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah dude his, his stuff pain. is pretty sweet so that's sick, um dude. But yeah so i did that a couple weeks ago and then uh this week <laughs> i've been out fishing and I've still been on my carp, carp kick and I'm, I'm getting them figured out, man. I think I've caught six now, something like that. Dang, um, dude. And it's, I'm starting to get them like figured out on how to fish for them, how to throw to them, how to work the fly. And, uh, I caught one the other day and it was just me and Adeline out there and Adeline want to be out there playing with her <laughs> bubbles. And, um, so she was playing with her bubbles and I hooked into one and it was big. It took, this fish took me to my backing four separate times and I would get it all the way to me and I'll try to grab it. And the second I would touch the tail and the tail was so fat, I couldn't grip it with one hand and I don't have a net big enough for that fish. I have one like big net, but it's a boat net and I didn't want to deal with having to carry it out there with me. Cause I was standing knee deep in water. And, um, 
I threw her my phone because she wanted to record me. And so I threw her my phone and she's recording. And her commentary on these videos <laughs> was like, so she recorded, it was like a 12 minute and 55 second video. And so I took little clips of it and I posted um, on the social medias. And I want to make a little edit because it was just too freaking adorable. But there's two clips that I'll show you. And, and I'll put them here um, on the podcast. I'll play them for you. But her commentary is what made the thing like the video is so freaking adorable but this carp was absolutely massive but i'll go ahead and play these videos real quick get that get that fish get that fish get that fish dad dad you can do it get the fish get the fish i know you're trying try 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 <laughs> Dude, the little voice crack at the end. So Dad, adorable. you can make salmon with that fish. <laughs> we can eat two salmon. <laughs> I mean, we can eat oh two dinners <laughs> if we have time. Oh, we can eat dessert. <laughs> so this child loves salmon. So. um Whenever she sees a big fish, she wants to make salmon out of it, even though obviously it's not salmon. But she was so happy that I that I was trying to get this fish. And, and she said that when I grabbed the fish, I think it was the second or third time I brought it to me, I grabbed the tail and it took off. And then it breached like probably 15 feet from me. And the video is all shaky because, you know, she's six and she's not keeping it on me and stuff. But the commentary is what made the video like it's, it's not a cinematic masterpiece, but it is freaking adorable. The and commentary is awesome. It. Yeah, and That's then a, she was able to get a picture of me once I landed it, and I brought it on the bank. Excuse me, and I brought it on the bank, and um, yeah, dude, it was just it was a good time. That's such a cool moment for you and AJ, dude. <clears throat> dude, it was. I I played that uh, that video where she's like, "You gotta try, try, try." <laughs> I played that for my <laughs> for my buddy in the lab. I was like, "Dude, you want to hear something really cute?" And uh, he's just listening to it. He starts laughing. He goes, "Dude, we need to have her come to the field with us, man. When we need, when we're feeling down and tired." We'll be we'll be knocking stuff out real quick. I was thinking about for real. <laughs> right. Dude, she's so freaking positive. Like know, I'll be man. having a, a bad day at work or whatever, or just dealing with daily stress and I'll get home and then she's just so upbeat and supportive and she's just a sweetheart. But yeah, she was she was loving it. And I want to get her on a fish like that because she wants to do it, but it's so hard to get to them. And she has a little bitty, you know, Moana push button uh, rod, and it's hard to cast it out because I'd have to cast it a good ways out. That's why I had to wait out in this instance um, because I can't even, you know, cast my fly rod that far to where they're out there cruising at. Um, they're not breeding anymore, so they're not up on the banks. So it's hard to get her little rod out there, but I need to find a spot where I can get her on a decent fish. I want to take her to Dry Run Creek here in Arkansas where it's catch and release and only children can, can go there. I think below 16 years of age. And um, I want to take her and Peyton before Peyton turns 16 uh, to go out there and do, they got some big, like 30 inch plus hook jaw trout that Jeez. I would love to get them on. So That'd I'm hoping awesome. maybe, maybe sometime this summer I might be able to take them up there and, and do something, maybe fish there on the cicada hatch, dude. Could you imagine that? Dude, that would be sick. <clears throat> right. So I need to tie up some cicadas and may maybe I could take them up there. Um, Josh Baker posted a, a picture earlier of um, a periodical cicada that he had caught up there in North Arkansas. And I'm like, oh, crap, is the hatch already starting? He said it's not hot and heavy yet. Um, so I'm hoping that they're not gone by the time uh, me and a couple of buddies go up in June. So yeah. I want to fish the cicada hatch so bad. Dude, that'd be sweet. <clears throat> yeah. I tried tying a cicada fly out of deer hair like a couple months back. It was pitiful. So I just cut it. <laughs> I just yeah, cut it right off I the tried hook. to tie a simple one out of foam and I got pissed off and cut it off the hook. <laughs> I've been, man, some people on Instagram, I've been, I've been, uh, I looked up cicada, uh, cicada flies because you want to see what, like how people are, are tying, what materials are using. Holy crap, dude. Some of these people are just insanely talented. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. Wild. Dude, did you see uh, Chase's new one that he put out? I His little have, spook cicada? I have not. Uh, Dude, it's pretty sweet. Dude, that guy, man, that guy can tie some sick flies. We, uh, yeah, I trout, can. I trout fest. He was there and he had some of his, uh, his game changers, bro. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how he can get the profile like so slick and, and just perfect. It's, it's a, it's a work of art. It's crazy. 
And his boots it's are like that, pretty that I'd legit. Be scared to actually throw. Yeah, if I if I and they're like and they're not cheap. If I pay them much money for a fly, I don't know if I would if I would yeah. throw because knowing my luck, I'm gonna snag a log or something. It's done, right? Or break it off or whatever. I I would be afraid to. Yeah, dude. I uh, I tied a, the I I would say the best tie that I've ever flied or the best fly <laughs> that I've ever tied <laughs> <laughs> was a. A uh, juvenile largemouth bass fly. It was an articulated fly, and it came out really good, in my opinion, for my lack of skill. And I paid so much attention to detail on this fly, and I even put a little bit of uh, amber uh, Palmer chenille underneath, like right, like probably a little bit just behind where the eyes would be. And because I was looking at, there was a, a larger bass chasing a school of of uh, smaller fish one time and i noticed when a lot of bait fish swim away that they flare their gills and so you can see a little bit of red and so i even put that chenille in there i was like it looked like a little gill plate in there like i put so much detail into this and then um even on the tail so i put some schlopping on the tail and i put a little black on the edge of it like it looked just like a freaking little largemouth bass to me and i was out there throwing it on a local body of water here that i've actually taken you to and it got hung up on the other side of this deep mm. hole. And I'm wearing my waders. And I was like, oh, I can't get to it. Ended up having to break it off. I was so sad. I was like, man, that's the best fly that I've ever tied. Dude. I'm having to let it go. Last week, the, when, when we went fishing, I was throwing a little deer hair popper. And I am not the... My deer hair work needs work. And they take a long... For me, they take a long time. I think I think one diver I tied... I probably spent three hours tying and trimming. It was it was a long process, and uh, and I don't know how long I spent on this one fly, but it was it was a, it was a while. It was an investment of time, and I freaking lost it into some reeds. And like there was some, yeah, it was I just made a bad cast or I got a little too close. So I was pushing my luck a little bit, and I snagged one of the one of the blades, and I just I just lost the fly. I was so mad, but. It just, you know, comes with the territory and like, I guess, and that's, and dude, it just sucks when you invest that much time into a fly and it just breaks off. That's yeah. probably, the, that's probably the worst part of losing flies. Like if yeah. it's something you can whip up pretty easy, that's no problem. But if it's something that you took your time, like really trying to, to get down and trying to create, man, it sucks. Yep. I agree with that. I have this frog fly that I tied that. I think looks pretty good silhouette style. It looks just like a frog to me. Um, and I just haven't thrown it because I'm scared. Cause I would where I would throw the frog would be in a lot of vegetation and I just don't want to lose it, you know? And I hear bass out there, uh, you know, chasing other stuff or you'll see them occasionally breach hitting something top water. And I'm like, and you hear frogs like nonstop out here. So I know there's frogs out there. And, uh, I tied up this fly. It looks a lot like a leopard frog. And, I just, I don't know, man. I, I'm I'm scared to throw it because I don't want to lose it. Yeah, <laughs> I know the feeling, man. Yeah, I know the feeling. So it's crazy, dude. Like there's <clears throat> some of these guys who tie these really intricate deer hair stuff. I wonder if they feel the same, or if it's yeah, it's so cool. I can just tie another one, but because mm-hmm. I enjoy the process, it's just again, it's just an investment, especially for someone who's not as skilled in that i think it takes me especially long because i'm you know i'm not it takes me longer but yeah man it's it's uh it is frustrating but it's just fly fishing yep that it is i mean and at the same time it's kind of one of those things where i would much rather tie up a guide fly because for one you get more bang for your buck in terms of time you know you don't spend as much time and then it's not as heartbreaking when you lose them so yeah but that's all a part of it and that's kind of this, this sounds bad. Like, I, I feel like my tying has improved. I mean, I, I would like to say it has improved since I first started. But at the same time, like I, since I'm not selling flies or anything like that, I don't really care to an extent how they look. Um, yeah. I'd rather just tie the thing and fish it. I mean, I still like to tie pretty flies. I'm proud of myself whenever I, I tie a fly. I'm like, dang, dude, okay. For me, that fly looks pretty good. Like, I feel pretty good about that, but I don't really care all that much if, if it's like the prettiest fly ever. Um, mm-hmm. but I, yeah, I think it's for me, it's just finding the balance of like tying a fly that you're proud of 
but also a fly that you're not spending forever just trimming or just tying, you know, because yeah. you can easily spend, especially with deer hair, you can easily spend, you know, an hour or so trimming that thing. It's crazy. Yeah. I've, I've yet to get into stacking or spinning deer hair and, yeah. uh, mainly because of the time allotment. Like I know that I'm going to sit there and I'm a perfectionist and it's going to be two, three hours on one fly. I, I, and I've tied game changers. I've tied feather changers yeah. and game changers, but I just have yet to even start messing with spinning or stacking deer hair. I think for deer hair with deer hair, I'm more, I do pay more attention to detail because it's the little things that can make or break it, especially when it comes yeah. to durability. Like if you, mm-hmm. you know, if you ease up on your tension too much, that thing will fall apart. Um, if you are not careful with your reps, you can, you know, you can trap hair and it can distort the patterns and all this stuff. It's just, there's a lot more detail. I think that has to be given to making one of those flies in order to make it like look pretty. And then also just the trimming, man, the trimming is the worst part. The trimming is scary for me because you got to be really like really deliberate with that razor. Cause once mm-hmm. you take it, once you take it off, you can't put it on. So if you yeah. make too steep of a cut or whatever, dude, that thing is wrecked. And all those hours you put at the, at the vice is for nothing. And it's, it's that to me is the scariest part about tying anything with deer hair. Even yeah. like sometimes I tie these little sliders with, uh, for, for redfish with the little deer hair head. And even then, man, like if I take too much off the top, it just looks wonky. And sometimes I'll just cut it off and I'll just redo it. But, yeah. um, but yeah, dude, it's just when I'm tying with deer hair, I think that's when I pay a little bit more attention to detail because I think it's more deserving of it. Like you could easily mess it up easily. I feel like it could be very rage inducing. <laughs> yes. I've been very frustrated, <laughs> very frustrated yeah. at times. Once I get a little bit more free time, I need to, I, I want to learn how to do it. I just, it's hard for me to say, you know, I'm going to allot the time to do that, but I yeah. need to. Dude, there's a video actually, um, I think I sent the link to Grant, if I'm not mistaken. I'll send it to you, but there's a video. You you have to pay for it. It's like seven bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it is really, really good. Like the amount of detail that goes into making the video, the little tips and tricks that they show you to kind of get the technique down. I mean, it is awesome. I, I used following that video, I tied a I tied a uh a diver and it, I mean, comparing a diver I tied after watching that video and one I tied before, it was nine day. Like my, really? Yeah, it was just my final product was way better. And um, I haven't caught any fish on it yet, because, also because I'm, I'm afraid to throw it. But uh, I feel like I feel like durability wise, it'll probably last a little bit longer than some of the other ones I've tied because yeah. of some of the little tricks and things that they show you in that video to help with durability. But it's yeah, it, it's um, it's pretty awesome. Well, that on its own sounds like it's worth $7. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> worth the money. That's awesome. Well, that's that's uh, something that I probably need to end up doing at some point. But we are coming up on our time. So is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we go ahead and get off here? Um, Just thank you all for hanging with us for this past year. Um, whether you're an old listener and you, you know, we hope that we hope that we can continue producing content that you will find interesting and enjoy. And, um, yeah, just thank you for, for hanging with us and hopefully, you know, you can be along for the ride. As long as this ride is gone, we have no idea what's to come with this, with this podcast or where it's going, but you know, just thank you for everything. We appreciate it. We really appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for all the support and, uh, we'll catch y'all next time. This has been wildlife outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.